Welcome back to the Business Cast, episode number 40. So what I want to do in this one, there's going to be a video version available as well if you're into that sort of thing. Um, I want to look at two films that came out a while ago, and I'd seen them at the time, but I've watched them again kind of recently, and I noticed there was quite a lot of like themes that they had in common and stuff like that, and it got me thinking about a few things. So the films in question are, one, a documentary that came out in 2008, Anvil, the story of Anvil, and the other one is the David Brent Life on the Road film. Now, the David Brent film is not a documentary, it's a fictional comedy. Um, the David Brent character, if anyone remembers the sitcom The Office, the UK version, the original version, he was the boss, um, which I, that was a show I actually liked quite a lot. Um, I liked the American version as well, I think in a different way, because there was it was done differently, and there was a lot of characters in the American version that kind of weren't compatible to characters in the British one. So they kind of expanded it a bit, but there was this kind of mundane bleakness in the British one that they don't seem to kind of do the same way in American television. I like that, but anyway, the movie kind of catches up with David Brent because he's not been the manager of the office for a while. In fact, he's a salesman for some sanitary products, <laughs> shall we say, company. Um, when we see him, and he must be in his, like, his 50s or something at this point. And the whole idea was that he was in a band when he was younger <laughs> called Foregone Conclusion. Uh, oh, by the way, I should mention, I'm going to spoil the shit out of both of these films for you, so if you don't want me to do that, don't listen without watching them. Um, but anyway, aye, so what he does is, instead of putting this band back together, he decides to hire some young session musicians and to book a tour, and like he books a bus and hotels and all this, you know, despite the fact that all the gigs are like within a short drive from his house. Um, so it'd be that like, he's not got much money, so he cashes in like all these pensions that he had in the 90s and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so it's quite funny. So as you can imagine, I mean, the tour is just like a complete shit show. You know, like the songs are all, they're all him trying to be compassionate towards like other races or the disabled or whatever. But like, because he's not driven to write those songs out of any compassion for anyone, he's driven to write them based on what he wants people to think he is. So they all come out like terrible and offensive, but it is quite funny. Um, and there is kind of two, two themes in it that stand out as well, like in the film. I mean, one of them is like, David Brent's got your classic old school music industry view, you know, like, before he goes out on this tour, he starts, you know, phoning all these record companies and stuff like that, and, you know, he says, oh, they'll send a scout down and all this kind of thing, and he thinks that that's, you know, what's, he's going to go from being some nobody old man to, like, being a rock star, and this is part of, like, the fiction that we talked about, I've talked about it a few times on the show with different people, you know, like how someone I was speaking to that worked at a record company was saying to me that, to what extent this was ever true that you know there was that fiction in the music industry that if you can get like a gig at a good club or something like that on some good bill you know there might be someone some mr rig from a record company in the audience you know and he's just waiting to spend a fortune on you and to make you your unknown arsa star which you know like isn't really the case you know like from what i've been told you know like a lot of record companies nowadays particularly and you know unless you've released some kind of music digitally or built up some kind of following they're not going to be you know that interested unless you've done something independently i mean the whole thing is the David Brenton phone in these record companies, it's just wasting his time because nobody ever shows up. In fact, there is one point where one scout shows up and I put like to the club he's playing in and upon meeting David David Brent, he just immediately asks him like how old are the band? You know, like so that's the thing. I mean, it's it's just it's never gonna happen. I mean, but a lot of people still really have this kind of old school music industry kind of view. That's the thing, but like the other point is like, why would he be doing it? at his age, you know, like, he's man's admitted to be in his 50s, you know, um, and I think as well, to answer this question, we have to look at, like, sort of, maybe the difference between the UK and US versions of The Office, because Michael Scott, who was the boss in the American version, he was more of the kind of guy that you got the impression he was a really nice guy and stuff like that, but it was just that he came across badly to people and that's why he didn't have any friends or anything like that. But in the British office, I mean, this film does a bit to rehabilitate him, but it is more kind of implied that, like, David Brent, he's got a lack of, like, moral, like, it seems that he might have a conscience, but he has a lack of, like, moral courage, because he'll do, like, shitty things to people, and then he'll, like, try and lie his way out of it, and, you know, it makes you kind of dislike him quite a bit in the series. So that's what I think is one of the motivations would be behind him doing the tour in the first place, because... He's got, he's supposed to have like no romantic life, you know, no friends or anything like that, not really, apart from the wee guy in his work. And the whole idea is really that like, the reason that he's going on this tour is because, I, well, this is my opinion, right? <laughs> I love reading into things too much. But I think he's got an unconscious drive 
to have connection with other people that he doesn't have. And he thinks because he's been repelling people and alienating people for like pretty much his entire life, that the way to get that human connection with other people will be through kind of things like, you know, being famous, you know, having a lot of money, you know, having some status. Then people want to hang out with him regardless if he's a terrible person or not. I mean, there's loads of famous people that are terrible people and you could say, well, they're not really going to be your friends, are you? Maybe not, but does he care? It doesn't seem that way. You know, it seems like he's just like, you know, and then that's two really classic human drives, like two unconscious drives, you know, human connection and status. And that's really what he's looking for. Because, I mean, he seems aware that people don't like him, you know, like he even pays the band to hang out with him and stuff like that. He's kind of aware, like on that level. Um, but I don't know what level the characters are meant to be aware that he understands, you know, maybe all these impulses and stuff like that. You know, it's like there's a, he's like living this beta lifestyle, but there's this unconscious alpha part of his brain, you know, that is driving him to do this. And the music is just more the vehicle for this unconscious drive, this need for status, this need for connection with other people. Um, but, you know, it does bring up another point as well when you think about it. And that is like, when do you give something up? Like, when is it time to say this isn't working? Let's do something else. And that brings me nicely to Anvil, the story of Anvil. Um, so this is a documentary about a real band that came out in 2008. Um, and it starts off with like, you see Anvil playing, you know, they shared a stage in the early 80s with like Bon Jovi, Scorpions and stuff. And you see like Lars Ulrich from Metallica slash Lemmy um, all talking about Anvil at the start of the film and saying how great they were and how much they liked them and all this kind of thing. But then this is like 30 years later and 13 albums later and, you know, the band are still like nobody, basically. Um, so it's sort of like the, the why is that kind of thing, you know. Um, I mean, it follows, basically the film focuses on the two founding members who are still in the band. The other two guys that originally ended left by this point. So they are Lips, who is the guitarist and singer, and Rob the drummer. And I mean, you see them in their seemingly mundane lives. I mean, like they follow Lips going about doing, he's got like a delivery job and stuff like that. And, you know, then <laughs> we see them embark on a low budget tour of Europe. And there is that Brent comparison there because, I mean, before they go on the tour, Lips is like phoning about record companies and he's got the same delusion that Brent has. You know, the same idea of like, oh, if I can just get one of these scouts in here and they can see how awesome we are, it won't matter that we're like in our 50s and stuff. Which is just, you know, it's kind of madness when you think about it in a way. And I'll just mention this now. I know some people want to bring up the fact that, like, they'll go, oh, C6 Steve became famous as an older man. He didn't really. I'll link the article at the bottom, but there's a Guardian article that came out in 2016. He'd said he was 10 years older than he was. He was actually from California. He was a session man. I believe he, produ he produced Modest Mouse as, like, debut album or something like that. I'll link the, I'll link the thing at the bottom. So... If you're going to point to that as someone who gets famous later on in life, it's not happening. But I mean, I think it's a genre-dependent kind of thing. But the thing that, you know, Anvil and David Brent are both going for is not just like to carve out a little niche for themselves and, you know, some kind of, so we say like experimental or some kind of like musical community. It's more like they want to be like the big arena pumping rock star kind of thing. And it's just, it's, it's just kind of crazy, you know what I mean? Um... But yeah, like, so, it follows Lips and Rob, you know, and Lips seems to have kind of significant emotional problems. I mean, there is a point, there's two points that you see him in the film where he's actually got his hands on somebody. At one point, as a club owner who's not paying him in Europe, so, like, fair enough. But at another time, it's like they're just recording, you know, they're recording an album, and him and Rob, they fall out about something, it's not really clear what. And, you know, they're very kind of like, there's all this kind of thing between them where they're at each other's throats and then they're best friends again and kind of thing. And... I mean, I don't even know if it's meant to be like all the years of disappointment have finally sort of taken their toll on him. And I don't know, maybe he was always like this. I mean, who knows? I mean, I don't know. I think in real life, he personally, Lips I'm talking about, the singer, would drive me absolutely bonkers. Um, and by the way, like, I'm not really looking to offend anyone or anything like that, but this is just the objective facts as I see it. So that's just, <laughs> that's just how it's going to be. Um... But the, where Lips differs from the Brent character, he has kind of the same thing in a way that, you know, he's a guy in his 50s trying to be like a big rock star. And the difference is with the Brent film, it's meant to be that he was in this band and then, you know, the band broke up when they were all young. And now, like, as an older man, decades later, he's putting together a new band with the same name. 
But whereas with Anvil, it's like they're actually a real band, they're not fictitious, and they've been going consistently for 30 years at the point this film was made. And you know, when they're releasing their 13th album, and still not much has really happened for them. You know, they're playing at like half empty clubs and stuff like that. And um, it's so unlike Brent, though, Lips has got like a wife and kids and stuff like that. He's got friends and things. So it doesn't seem like he's got the human connection drive that David Brent has. However, Throughout the film, there's a numerous times when Lips talks about what he deserves, this deserves that, it deserves this, we deserve this, you know, this kind of thing. He's got this kind of sense of entitlement. Um, and you see it as well, like, there's a point when he's talking to, like a, a, so like, a record company guy, and he's like, this shouldn't even go out on an indie label, you know, this, it's almost like to release the album on an indie label would be beneath it, and, you know, it has to be on a major label because that's, this album's that good. You know, it's it's that sort of thing, and... I really don't know where he gets the entitlement from because I mean like you take the famous people at the start of the film who talk about Anvil you know like Lars Ulrich made good music with Metallica you know Slash Guns N' Roses obviously I mean Lemmy I'm not crazy about Motorhead he did good stuff with Hawkwind I mean everyone likes Ace of Spades as well let's let's face it um but I've listened to Anvil quite a lot in preparing for this show and I'm just really bored by it it's just kind of like I mean, even if, say we compare something that came out, like, I think there was, like, everyone talks about the Anvil album Metal on Metal, I think that was 81, and I believe Metallica's Kill Em All was 83. If you compare those two albums, roughly about the same time, similar kind of style of music, I mean, it's just night and day. I mean, there's nothing about, Anvil's music feels a bit kind of superficial to me. Um, there's nothing that, like, hits you in the feels with it, if you know what I mean. It's just kind of, technically it's fine. It's, all, it's decent, you know, but like it's there's just nothing about it that like pulls you in. Really, it's not got that. I hate to use the phrase X factor, but you know what I mean. Every all good music has got something that draws you into it, and you can't always verbalize what that thing is, but you know it's there, you know, because it's obviously it's such a pull on you. And I just don't. For me, you know, their music just doesn't have that. It's just I'm not that interested in it. So, like I said, I mean, it's. I think as well, see if you even just want to do a quick comparison. I mean, listen to Metal on Metal and then listen to Kill em All by Metallica. Even compare, like, the song Metal on Metal. Compare it with anything on, like, Kill em All, you know, like, Metal Militia, Pulling Teeth, you know, Motor Breath, anything like that. And I think the difference is quite stark between, like, a band that were similar and around at the same time, but with just a massive difference in, you know, just in talent and capability, basically, you know. Um... That's the thing, and Anvil's lyrics are pretty cheesy as well, I'm sorry, but they really are. It's really quite bad. So, Lips feels he deserves it, so he's obviously got a different motive from Brent, although what he feels he deserves is the same as Brent, in that way, where he's already seems to have the human connection, but he doesn't have the status he feels he needs, you know, and that's obviously an important thing, you know, in, in humanity, basically, to have the status you feel you need. And like I said, I mean, I don't know what's happened in this guy's life, to kind of make him feel like he deserves this kind of status, I've not got a clue, but I think there must be something, you know. But um, I want to mention as well, like, I've kind of focused a bit more on Lips, he's kind of a more interesting character, but obviously I mentioned that Rob the drummer is the other original member that they focus on in the film, and Rob's quite a sad character, actually. He seems very sad a lot of the time. There's a bunch of times when he's leaving the band and stuff, he's quitting. And the weirdest part is when he's like showing you about his house and he's showing you some paintings he's done and kind of like city scenes and stuff like that and they're quite well done, that kind of thing. And then he takes you to like a room and it's got like a, a staircase leading down to what looks like it's like a basement or something like that, it's all kind of dark. And above that is this, is this framed picture that he did and it's a toilet bowl with a large brown shite in it. Like, that's what it is. And that's all it is. And he's like, what did the camera really focus in on the shite because he's done like all this perspective, like not perspective, texture and stuff on it, like, you know, and it's really textured and that, and he's quite proud of it. And it's just weird, like, it's it's weird why you would paint it in the first place. I mean, I don't know if he's psychologically saying I'm shit or something, but, I mean, it's not even like, like, it's not like extreme art, it's not like you could say, like, it's, you can't hide behind the thing that say, like, the piss Christ could hide behind or something like that. This just seems like juvenile and really a bit stupid. And I don't know why you would, paint it in the first place it's just a really bizarre scene in the movie i do have a kind of semi theory that i'll advance towards the end but that's no, it's quite strange but like um it's weird but i like I, like i said i was saying earlier on as well so but when do you give something up you know because these guys are in their 50s at this point and they're still going for it you know well two of them are 
And I think maybe like, you know, it's, you could say like with Lips and with his wife and his kids and all that, you could say like, wouldn't you want a better life for them? But I think he genuinely thinks that Anvil is the way to do that. That is again the vehicle to do that. That's what he knows how to do, you know. And I think as well, at that point in the film, I mean, if you've stuck in it for 30 years, it's going to be hard to give up like 30 years of your life for something. I mean, that is a long, long time to spend really doing something, you know, and especially if you've been like, I can't imagine what failing for 30 years does to you. Who knows, maybe in 30 years. But like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know if it, like, if it does stuff to you. I mean, maybe it does. I mean, look at those, like I said, there's two original band members. The other two were able to give it up. I don't know their circumstances, but they're not in the band anymore. But maybe music wasn't the thing wasn't the vehicle to satisfy their unconscious drives or needs, if you want to put it that way. Maybe it was something different for them. I don't know. I don't know anything about them. That's just a, it's just a wee theory. But the two guys that are left, they do seem like Rob and Lips. They do seem kind of like teenagers in a way. You know, they seem kind of emotionally immature. They seem a bit immature themselves. Things they find are funny and stuff like that. There's just a lot about them that seems like quite immature. And I don't know. I wonder if they maybe got stuck in one life phase for too long and they just couldn't get out of it you know and that just sort of became their lives i mean it's possible i mean i don't know how many people around them were telling them to give this up or whatever but the only person in the film i mean there, there is a lot of delusion in this film a whole lot of delusion the only person you really see like talking a bit of sense is rob's sister you know she says it's been 30 years and 13 albums you know don't you think something would have happened by now you know she seems to be the, and everyone else is kind of quiet apart from like, <laughs> like i think it's uh, rob's wife but like I don't know, man. It's it's just like, I can understand why they didn't give it up. And this brings me back to another thing as well that I mentioned on the Kill Your Friends show, um, episode 38, I believe. And that was that um, between, you know, like you could have, you could be extremely high talented, but have like low ambition and be lazy as fuck and just never really do anything with yourself. Or you could be a sort of like, you know, moderately talented sort of person, but be really driven, driven to learn how to do the thing you're doing, to, you know, push yourself forward, to put in the time and effort and work, and you can actually become successful with moderate talent. So, like, you know, and given the choice between extreme talent and extreme laziness, or, you know, extreme ambition and moderate talent, you know, I would go for the latter if it's, you know, obviously the best would be extreme talent and extreme ambition, but not a lot of people have that. <laughs> Definitely got the laziness as well. But, like, um, so these guys have obviously been doing it then. It just puts the theory to the test. So they're doing it for 30 years. They've still got nowhere. Surely they seem very ambitious. They seem driven to do it. They seem like they've been working hard. So why not? But then, you know, when this film comes out, after this film comes out, things start to change for them. They start to get on tours. You know, they tour with like Scorpions. They open for ACDC and stuff like that. They, get, uh, they were on Conan O'Brien. They were on a VH1 special. They had like a book come out. It was I had a foreword written by Slash and all this kind of thing. So it's almost like it did pay off, but it just like took 30 odd years for it to, for it to happen for them, which is weird, you know, because at the end of the Anvil film, they get what they want. And so does David Brent, essentially, because, I mean, essentially the story at the end of the David Brent film is that, you know, everyone then does kind of like him because they, he learns that he needs to not be what other he thinks that other people will think is cool. But just be himself and then people will like him and they'd sort of do that thing at the end it's a sort of classic gervais happy ending but he does brent get what gets what he wants <laughs> at the end of the film and in the same way so do lips and rob they all get what they want and the thing i like about it is that in both cases it's not perfect you know that's what makes it more human because when do you ever perfectly get what you want and it pretty much never happens you know what i mean but like the, that's what i think is quite cool about it the fact that like you know, in this kind of really human way, they do actually get the thing they're looking for in this kind of roundabout way, you know? And um, I do have a semi-conspiracy theory about this. Because, I don't know, I mean, there is wee kind of spinal tappy bits in it, like they visit Stonehenge, it finishes with them playing in Japan, um, and then well, going to Japan, and then there's like, um, there's a bit in the Anvil film where... Lips and Rob are sitting there and they're talking about like the first song we wrote and it's weirdly similar in some ways to that Spinal Tap scene where they're talking about the first song like they wrote but the Anvil guys, I mean you need to watch this film, it's so funny but they're like, you know, it was it was called Thumbscrew and it was inspired by the Spanish Civil War and it's just so spinal, they start singing it a bit and then they end up re-recording it, it's so Spinal Tappy 
And a part of me makes me think, were they playing characters in this or were they playing up aspects of their personalities to make this a more interesting film? Because see, if this was just a film about some sad old men who'd never made it and stuff, I might have watched it once and been like, wow, that was depressing, let's get drunk or something. But like, I've watched this Anvil film loads of times and it never gets old. It is hilarious, it's so funny. And I'd really do recommend you watch it. I haven't ruined it for you at all. There's so many wee bits in it. It's great. And if it wasn't this funny, I mean, the film's been really highly rated and a lot of people like it and stuff like that. So I think that's obviously, if they did this on purpose, you know, played characters or played up aspects of their personalities, then they were geniuses to do it because it worked for them. If that's what they did. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know them, but... Because even when you think about it off the back of this film, a lot of people will have gone to see them ironically just because of the movie. I mean, if I was at like a... If I was at some kind of festival or something and I heard Anvil were playing, I'd go and see them ironically, absolutely. I don't know if this is a millennial generation thing, seeing bands ironically, but I have I have, I have seen bands ironically, absolutely. So if that was the plan, then fair enough to them, you know, they got it, they got what they wanted. So let me try and film this up in some sort of way. So I just happened to watch these two films again, just round about the same time, you know. And, you know... They're exploring, even though one's fact and one's fiction, they're exploring similar themes, you know, like older guys who dreamed of being famous in their youth who are given the dice for one last roll, you know, and like I said, it brings up the question of when is the time to quit something, you know, like 10, 20, 30 years, you know, and if Anvil hadn't have kept on for 30 years, they wouldn't have made the impact that they've made now, I probably wouldn't even be talking about them, wouldn't know who they are, you know, they would just have been some sort of metal band from the 80s that nobody really cares about anymore, so... You know, and like I said, it does kind of lend some credence to that theory that, like, you know, if you want high ambition and moderate talent over high talent and low ambition or moderate ambition, you know, the ambition can take you, can sometimes, like, make up for a lack of talent in a lot of ways if you've got that ambition and the drive to, like, to, to really take something on and learn it, to learn how, like, even if you're not good at something, to learn how people who are good at it do it and to practice and to make yourself better at it. You know, that's not something that everyone does. Most people, if they can't get something, they're like, nah, fuck this, I'll just do something else. And, you know, I've been guilty of that in the past and stuff. But I've, I've, I've noticed it more. There was a friend of mine, you know, and he's like in his late 20s now, and he, he never learned to play guitar and stuff like that, you know, and I was like, I could show you how to play guitar. You know, he tried a few chords, and he was like, no, this is too hard, this will take me forever. And he just, that was him. He was just done with it after, like, half an hour. So, like, it's true, it will take a while, you know, but, like, it's just sticking with it and like I said for not everyone it's the music thing you know it's just in these cases you know the music is you know it's just a vehicle for them because the real thing that's driving them is this unconscious desire you know in Brent's case particularly for human connection but in both cases as well for status you know these unconscious drives or needs that we have you know like and that's the thing you can it's not even just music people do it through other things through like you know art and sport and all these kind of things you know usually that's just the outward expression of an inward drive you know, so with Brent or Anvil, in a way, it's not really about the music. It kind of is, but it's not really. You know, the story is more about their unconscious drives. You know, and then it's a powerful motive. So then from these unconscious drives, we get a lot of good music, a lot of good art. We get a lot of shit as well. But it's kind of all part of it, I suppose. So I think that pretty much covers up. Covers up. <laughs> covers what I wanted to say. Um... Yeah, really good movies, both of them. I highly recommend them. David Brent, Life on the Road, and Anvil, the story of Anvil. Definitely check them out. Well worth it. I suppose we will wrap it up there. Um, I'm not going to play any Anvil songs or David Brent songs, just in case anyone's a bit litigious, you know. Um, but <laughs> go to the website, bresnix.com, B-R-E-S-N-I-X.com. Follow me on Twitter, at Vladimir Bresnix. My album that is just called Bresnix is out. If you search Vladimir Bresnix on any of your favourite digital music streaming sites you will find it and um, i'll just leave you with one of the songs off said album so from my album bresnix this is always raining the gray sky always looked to me like a blanket it was always raining it's always raining it's always raining everything was so green The bugs came out with his dam. Sometimes there's the crunch of a snail. It was always raining. It was 
Sometimes I get sick of the rain. I realize it doesn't have to be like that. 